William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's an old school motto with a modern twist, folks. An empty barrel makes a fine casket. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Manhattan Island's my beat. From Battery Place uptown to Spite and Dilo. I've got my footprints on every inch of sidewalk. A memory in every mile. Get used to a beat and it's like home to you. You're an island native and only a pretty fancy fee can drag you even across the river to Brooklyn or three other boroughs. To drag you out of town needs a major earthquake or an act of Congress. So how come I find myself 40 miles from Broadway in an incorporated village called Seneca on the trail of a claw murderer? A nice little gent with side whiskers like Abraham Lincoln coaxed me into it. Town Supervisor Samuels, he called himself. His pitch went something like this. I came straight to you from Lieutenant Trav Rogers of your Metropolitan Police, Mr. Craig. Yeah, Lieutenant Rogers phoned me. You just left his office. No dice, old man. Seneca's off my beat. But, but it's a situation of desperate emergency. What's the population of your village, Samuel? Uh, uh, 300. A killer can't lose himself in that small a crowd. But then... Uh, Order every townsman to line up in the public square. Then go up and down the line. When you see a wild gleam, nab him. A wild gleam? The guy you're looking for is a lunatic, first class. The claw used in the killing shows that. One nut in the neighborly crowd? Your sheriff can't be that helpless. Well, he is. Berkey's only honorary sheriff. His business is farm tools and tractors. Who's your regular sheriff? We have nobody. Crime in Seneca is a rare thing. <laughs> Don't even have a jail. Pass the hat and build yourself one. Crime's here to stay, people say. Uh, the board of supervisors empowered me to supersede Berkey, to contract outside help, someone experienced in homicide. You were highly recommended. By Trav Rogers. The lieutenant's having his joke. Please, Mr. Craig. You're a nice town supervisor, and you look like a tin type of an old favorite uncle of mine. I'd like to help you, but uh, no amount of pleading, no power on earth, not 50 claw killings can entice me 40 miles from New York. In Seneca, flanked by Samuels and the sometimes sheriff, I got a look at the corpse. The morgue was the back room of a taxpayer divided into a grain, oats, and seed shop and mortuary parlor. Uh, this was Dr. Tyler, Mr. Craig. A doctor, huh? A uh, horse doctor. Oh, sad day for Dobbin. Pretty thorough job of annihilation. Uh, shocking crime. The claw marks on the skull were made by a garden tool, looks like. Yeah. Did Doc Tyler have any enemies? Uh, let the sheriff answer, Samuels. Why, no. Not to my knowledge, he didn't. Doc Tyler was a pillar in the community, a fine, respected Save man. Save the uh, eulogy for the funeral services, huh? Theft, then. Was anything stolen? No, I'll have to say no to that. All Tyler had was accounts receivable. Bills owing him for his doctoring work. You went over his property, then? I did. The robbery was my notion, too, at first. I ordered an inventory of everything Tyler owned, right down to the horse pails. And nothing was missing? Nothing of any account, no. Except for old Baldy, everything was right where it belonged. Except for old Baldy, you say? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, old Baldy's an old iron paperweight, uh, the American Eagle. Doc Tyler always had it on his desk or on top of a pile of papers. And old Baldy was missing? Yes. Yes, we couldn't find hide nor hair of it. Well, either somebody borrowed it and planted to keep it now that Tyler's gone, or Tyler threw it out. Or the murderer clawed Tyler to get it. Oh, now, uh, why would anybody want to commit murder for a worthless old paperweight? Can't say, but that's why I'm in this whistle stop, to find out why. And that brings us down to cases. You and me. Come again? You're being here. 
Samuels brought you out against me. Against you? No, no, Sheriff. Shut but... up, Samuels. This is between me and Craig. Against me, I said, Craig. Oh, I get it. Your pride's hurt, huh, Sheriff? When you've jackassed around a while and Samuels admits to being the finicky fool he is, I'm marching you to the railroad station. With a brass band and local school mom doubling as drum majorette. A big goodbye to a conquering hero, Sheriff, because my parting gift to Seneca is your claw murderer in person. Want a bet? I found overnight accommodations at a Miss Pringle's split seconds before a storm broke. Miss Pringle was a spinster who looked it, and a fluffy white poodle who looked as if he was eating himself into his grave to escape Miss Pringle. Uh, this is Fluff, Mr. Craig. Fluff, huh? Does he bark? Uh, seldom. Uh, Fluff has chronic laryngitis. Oh. oh. Uh, Dr. Tyler, peace to him, was treating Fluff. Sad about Dr. Tyler. Uh, you're here to find the fiend? I'm here to get a night's sleep. Very well. You, you can have the attic room. Why so high a climb? But I'm I'm not accustomed to taking male lodgers. Enough said. Blankets, towels, is everything there? Oh, yes, yes, the room is ready. And a wall outlet so I can plug in and shave? No, no, the electric wires don't extend to the attic. Oh. Uh, there's a kerosene lamp. Uh, now, if you go to your room... I You're can't... pushing me, Miss Pringle. But I'm not accustomed to men in my parlor. Enough said. I'll see you in my dreams. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Good night, Miss Pringle. There were things I wasn't accustomed to, like addicts, like figuring out how to light kerosene lamps, or like having the roof suddenly cave in on my head. I went down from a sneak blow, a club the weapon felt like. I went down, but not out. I could see through a red haze like a film of blood, and I could hear glass breaking somewhere in the room. I rolled on the floor, not to be a sitting duck for a second blow. But no second blow came. Just quiet and the rain outside. The rain blowing in from an open window. The window my sneak opponent had used getting in and out. I went out the window after him. Outside, just at the edge of Miss Pringle's driveway, I ran into a reasonable facsimile of King Kong. A guy who looked as if he should be swinging from trees. Sitting behind the wheel of an open convertible, its top down. Working the car starter and getting nowhere. Having trouble, friend? It's slow, don't want to go. The wires are wet. I'm driving good and then it stops. Your wires are wet. I'm driving good, and then it stops, and then it won't go. You're getting all tangled up in your IQ, friend. Doesn't the top go up? Yeah, easy. This button here, you push it. So push it. No. You've got a medium-sized lake around you. Floodwaters rising from the floorboard. I'm not pushing no button. I like it like this. How did you happen to stall here? I told you I'm driving good. And well, then it stops, and then it won't go. You making fun of me? No, 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 no. Did we meet a while ago? Huh? Where? In Miss Pringle's attic. No. I'm driving, so how could it be? How could it be? Parked here the last five minutes, did you see anybody in a hurry to quit the general neighborhood of Miss Pringle's? No. I see nobody. You're sure? Are you trying to mix me up? Nature got to you first. Just for future reference, uh, what name do you answer to? Harmony. Harmony? Yeah. You like it? Back in the attic with the kerosene lamp lit and Miss Pringle in a trembling spasm, I took stock of the room. Oh, what you've told me, Mr. Craig, it's unbelievable. Believe it. I wasn't born with this rhinoceros egg on my head. But what purpose I'm could I'm checking you... to see. 
This picture on the floor, where was it hanging originally? The kerosene lamp's throwing so many shadows, I can't see the nail hole. Why, it's hung there over the high boy. The glass broke. Yeah, it needs a new glass. A ship's print, huh? Yes, uh, uh, the princess Ida, an old whaling vessel. The picture have any special meaning? Special meaning? A value, an heirloom or something? Why, no, no value. I only paid a dollar for... Oh, wait. Yes, come to think of it, I was offered a good price for it. How good a price? One hundred dollars, if I recollect. For a dollar print? Who made the offer? The young Mr. Stanley, the one with the new antique shop out on North Rugby. Why didn't you sell the picture to him? Well, I'm not sure. For spite, I guess. Spite? Well, the young man was too persistent and, and bad-mannered. Calling me on the telephone and then tracking his muddy boots on my parlor rugs. But I don't understand why these questions. Somebody was up here to steal the picture. I got in the way and was struck down. But nobody stole the Princess Ida. It was dropped in the commotion and the getaway. I heard breaking glass while rolling on the floor. Oh, you're trying to frighten me. Just enough to make you twice the cautious miss you already are. No men in your parlor. There's one joker abroad who might not respect that rule. Oh, you, you, you're not alluding to the, the claw murderer. Bolt your door and sleep with one eye open. Oh, my... I've just found you beautiful, and I don't want to lose you. Mr. Craig. Yes, Miss Pringle. Uh, there's a fine room on the first floor right next to mine. Oh, no thanks. I'm getting to like the attic. There's electricity and, and a wall outlet you can shave. Oh, in. really kind of you. But I'm looking forward to roughing it. It'll toughen me up. Mr. Craig, I, I insist you move to the room downstairs next to mine. Oh, this creeping infatuation for me. Fight it, Miss Pringle, to your last drop of blood. We could get to be the talk of Seneca. I, I don't care, Mr. Craig. I, I'm frightened. <laughs> In the morning, I took breakfast with town supervisor Samuels. Breakfast and information. I'm sorry, Sheriff Berkey made you unwelcome. Berkey's sensitive to competition. I'm sorry about your injury. My injury? You were attacked and beaten last night. How could you know? Uh, Miss Pringle had me on the telephone in the middle of the night. Oh. I want to know about a couple of your townspeople. Yeah? First, uh, a bright chap who calls himself Harmony. Harmony? Now, what reason could you... Never mind. I'm asking the questions. Tell me about him. Uh, Harmony's big Toby Keller. Hires out for odd jobs. Spring plowing, window washing, garage work. How about dirty work? No. Craig, you're wrong about Harmony. I'd take an oath. His mind isn't uh, the best. But we know him to be good-natured, honest. Mm-hmm. What about a young Mr. Stanley? Fred Stanley? Uh, he's a newcomer to Seneca. What brought him here? Uh, a lawyer got him to come in the first place. From Chicago, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chicago. Fred Stanley came thinking he was a missing heir. Claim his grandfather's fortune. But there was no fortune. Only an old house just this side of the Seneca line. Not worth the taxes on it. Why was there any idea of a fortune at all? And the grandfather, old Mitchell Stanley, was said to be a rich miser who put no trust in banks. And when Mitch Stanley died, there wasn't a penny. They had to auction off his furniture to pay for his funeral. But young Stanley stayed on in Seneca. Yeah, opened an antique shop in the old Stanley house. Can he make out in a one-horse town like this? He has business signs posted on the highways, hoping to get the tourist trade. What's your interest in Fred Stanley? He tried to buy a ship's print, the Princess Ida, from a girlfriend of mine, Miss Pringle. Stanley offered $100 for a picture worth $1. A liberal offer like that... Craig! Craig! No, don't blow your gasket. It's only a parcel delivery through your closed window. Did you order this? What is it? A claw. A garden tool like the one used on Doc Taylor. And a note with it. It's addressed to me, Barry Craig. Get out of Seneca by ten this morning or never. Get out of Seneca by ten? Nine. Hmm, I've got an hour of grace. Or never. Craig, it's a threat against your life. Huh? Oh, I'll be planted in the country. A city fellow like uh, me. The handwriting. No handwriting. The note was put together with newsprint. Can I borrow your car? Yeah, of course. 
Uh, Stanley's Antique Shop is on North Rugby Road, uh, just this side of the Seneca line, you say? It's a three-mile drive, up the incline to Widder's Ridge, then left a quarter mile. Uh, Craig, be careful. Please, I, I don't want your murder on my conscience. Okay, I'll stay alive, but only for your sake, mind you. <laughs> Staying alive is a deal that sometimes needs the cooperation of unknown parties, in my racket, anyhow. Climbing the steep incline to Widow's Ridge. Climbing maybe 300 feet into morning mists as thick as pea soup. I knew I wasn't going to get that kind of cooperation. A rifle shot that blew a tire into confetti. Crash off the incline had to come. Funny distortions in your eye when you first come to and start taking inventory to see if you're alive. A half-frozen robin who didn't have the sense to fly south for the winter. He sat on the side of the hill ten feet from where I lay, staring solemnly at me and chirping prayers for my safety. Oh, when I started getting to my feet, the robin flew away. The inventory added up. I was all there in one piece with a few dents that couldn't hurt forever. Samuel's car was down at the foot of the incline, topsy-turvy like it was playing dead dog. I'd been thrown clear of the wreck. Half my fee into the poor box. I took an oath on that as I started for Rugby Road on foot. Fred Stanley gave me the expected answer. Just what do you find so unusual about my interest in buying old pictures, Mr. Craig? $100 for a $1 picture doesn't make sense. And why must it make sense? It's a cold, practical world, chum. People generally don't go haywire with money. They conserve it. Now, look, Craig. I collect Americana. Whatever strikes my fancy, I buy. The cost is secondary. But you're in business to buy cheap and sell at a profit. Technically, yes, but it doesn't work out that way. I love buying and I hate selling. A profit is rare. That gets expensive. Where does the money come from? That's none of your business, Craig. Now, if you don't mind, I'll terminate this interview. I'm in no hurry. Now, look here, Craig. And I'm in no mood for the polite, formal approach, Stanley. Or the kind of weasel talk you've been giving me. Or being terminated. Are you insane? I walked away from my own murder 20 minutes ago. I came to this whistle stop against my will to do a big good deed. And go home. I don't intend to settle here for keeps. But what has that got to you do... You lied to me. A fancy, eccentric pose that's as phony as a ham board of an acting Shemokin. The ship print signifies something more than just another antique. No polite, formal approach, Stanley. I'm going to pound the truth out of you. You're me. crazy. Let me go. Tell me about the Princess Ida ship print. Let go. Harmony. Harmony, help. Harmony, huh? Now we're making headway. So uh -huh. King Kong's hired out to you. Harmony, help. I want you to let Stanley uh, go. Uh, Strapping ape like you, Harmony, uh, you don't need a gun to take charge. I want you to let Stanley go. Sure, I'll let uh, Stanley go. I was only fixing his tie. Oh, Craig, you, you had no right to manhandle me, no right. It paid off. I got to find out who was providing Harmony with his raw meat. Harmony's with me on day hire. To do general cleaning and polishing, scrape down old furniture. Plus prowl and attics, plus distribute garden tools shaped like claws all over town, plus take rival shots at passing cars. You're out of your mind. You assaulted me and Harmony rescued me. Now get out of here. Sure. But I'll be back. I'll be back, Stanley. The minute I tumble to your motive. Back at Miss Pringle's to wash up and change my suit for a whole one, I found her prized parlor rug a mess. Spots all over it. And the dog Fluff suddenly cured of laryngitis and barking. Warm spots with a sticky feeling to the hand. Red like blood. Blood tracked in by Fluff from somewhere. followed the tracks to Miss Pringle's bedroom. The blood was Miss Pringle's goodbye to spinsterhood. The garden tool shaped like a claw lay beside her on the floor like a third hand 
Town Supervisor Samuels, aged 20 years and 20 seconds. Craig, it's, it's ghastly, ghastly. We'll skip the rhetoric. Miss Pringle was murdered by someone who made off with the Princess Ida. You know that? The picture is gone. I searched high and low. Uh, the murder then clears Stanley in harmony of any suspicion. No. But you saw them Ms. both. Miss Pringle could have been murdered earlier. While I was here, breakfasting with you. The Princess Ida and old Baldy. Two murders for two worthless relics. You're convinced these relics motivated the trustees? It figures. The relics and somebody's lust to kill for its own sake. We're dealing with a nut to boot. Do the articles have any history? History? A story, some legend they figure in, say. No, no. Nothing I know, Craig. Some background that could tell us why two hunks of junk produced two killings. I'm sorry. Is there anybody in Seneca who could know? A village librarian or a local historian? Uh, you could ask Will Briggs. Will used to be our recorder until the town board voted to abolish the job. Will Briggs? Uh, Will's crotchety, bad-tempered. I don't think he'll be disposed to help you even if he could. Even in a town crisis like this? Uh, Will Briggs don't feel very civic about Seneca and its problems. Since we abolished his job for economy reasons, Will's been feuding. Suing in the courts for pension, making a rumpus at town hall meetings. Great cooperative little town you've got here. Great job you wrote me into. <laughs> Will Briggs pulled a switch on Samuel's characterization of him. Briggs fell all over himself, cooperating. For twenty dollars, Mr. Craig. I am a man without funds. Twenty bucks, okay. You get it. That counted board of supervisors. Did you dirt? Old Baldy and the Princess Ida. Scratch your memory. Old Baldy and the Princess Ida. Funny now you should be asking about them. Why is it funny? You're the second party that's come to me asking. Who came first? Oh, Mitchell Stanley's grandson. The one who settled himself into a shop here a spell ago. Young Fred Stanley. What did you tell him? What I'll tell you. If you wait. I have the record here. Yes, here it is. The sales sheet, my own writing, for that auction they held at Mitchell Stanley's once. To raise money for burying him. I was craking for the auctioneer that day. Get to it, please. In my time. See? It says here we sold beds and tables and floor coverings. Down here it says Old Baldy. Fifty cents. Sold to Dr. Tyler. Princess Ida. One dollar. Sold to Miss Pringle. And the snowman sold for 75 cents. What's the snowman? The design on a patchwork quilt it's named for. Who bought it? Let me see. Sold to Adam Samuels, it says. That's the town supervisor himself. Where's your telephone, Briggs? Telephone? <laughs> he ain't never invented it. From its use to me, keeping body and soul together as it is. Briggs, don't bend my ears. What's got your back up? Samuels, your town supervisor's number three on the claw murderer's list. If it's so, I say good riddance to the black hearted. Good riddance are bad. Someone else would have to judge Samuels' merits as a human on earth. The garden tool, shaped as a claw, lay across the room where it had been thrown. A claw with bright red fingers. Fred Stanley resisted arrest to the last gasp. Harmony's last gasp, that is. Craig, get out of here. You're under arrest, Stanley. You have no authority. I've got a gun. Harmony! That ape man comes through the door and he's dead. Harmony! You're asking your moronic stooge to commit suicide? We'll see. Harmony! <laughs> One down, and Seneca's a better place for it. You... You killed him. He's only wounded. Where do you want it, Stanley? Uh, I'll go with you. Stanley put his confession on record after a little workout and a lot of sweating. I, I found a diary that once belonged to my grandfather, Mitchell Stanley. A diary hidden behind the oak paneling over a fireplace. In the diary, three pieces of a map were mentioned. A piece each hidden in Old Baldy, the Princess Ida, and the Snowman, huh? Yes. 
A, a treasure map. The three pieces were to fit together into a treasure map. Through them, I'd find the wealth my grandfather was reputed to have. The wealth that never turned up when he died. Insanity runs in the Stanley line, huh? My grandfather's whole genius was a genius for hiding and hoarding. Hiding from the world in that awful house at the edge of the town line. Hoarding his gold. Fantastic thing like a child's treasure map was well in character with my grandfather. The shabby trick, too, was well in character with my grandfather. What does that mean? Well, it was all a grotesque joke. My grandfather's ghoulish sense of humor. I killed three people for a load of junk. There weren't any pieces of map in Old Baldy. Or the Princess Ida, or the snowman. That diary, Stanley. Give it to me. Here. Go hunt yourself up some treasure, Craig. There was an anticlimax to the Stanley story. In a village beanery, with the sometime Sheriff Berkey trying to act apologetic and yet keep his dignity. Uh, I, I suppose you'll be leaving now, Craig. Eh? Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to stand on Broadway and flip a cigarette into the gutter. Well, I've been a jealous fool. So would I be in your shoes. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, uh, Will Briggs is coming over to see you. He says uh, you owe him something. Yeah, yeah. Twenty bucks for valuable services rendered. Craig? Briggs. It's not out of order now. To dun me for twenty bucks? <laughs> Here you are. Well, thank you. When we go. Stick around a minute, Briggs. I want to go over that feud you had with the town board. I'm over it now. Now with the town board extinct. Now that the murders of Doc Tyler, Miss Pringle, and Samuels have left Seneca without a town board. I'm not one to pillory the dead. But I'm one to pillory the living. Here's that alleged Mitchell Stanley diary that produced three murders. Is it now? And uh, this is that auction sales sheet in your own handwriting, as you told me. Do I have to tell you that the handwriting in both is the same, even down to the green ink? Greg, what are you getting at with Briggs? That Briggs here forged the diary, Sheriff, and planted it where young Stanley would be sure to find it. That Stanley killed three people Briggs hated while Briggs sat back and enjoyed the show. That young Stanley was only a dupe, a tool used for revenge. Make the arrest, Sheriff. And then flag down a train so I can scram out of this whistle stop. The sweet neighborliness around here is just killing me. Good night, folks. See you next week. Listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Diary of Death, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled A Time to Kill, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I have a wow of a time in the kindergarten when a whimsical corpse insists on playing hide and go seek. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Samuels was Louis Van Ruten. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Next, Robert Montgomery presents something different than news analysis on NBC.